So let's do some tracing, or let's start with a bit more context around that first. Um, I assume that pretty much everybody is logging, right? Everybody is doing some logs. And probably, or you might have heard or used or seen this one. Um, so this is the infamous Elk stack. And the, the end result might look something like this. You can filter down on results, and then you can search for whatever failed. And you can see, I don't know, something failed in here. and that's working well, and that's all good. But what you generally want to have in your logs, by the way, is a bit more structure. So generally, if you can, use log structured and then have more context. And then you might get something like this out of your logs. This is not tracing yet, but this is kind of like the preparation of adding more context to stuff around it. So for example, here I have a login event. And in the login event, you can see, first, I, I log in on an info level that something failed, but I don't just have a string, but I have some additional metadata. For example, I know that this is the event kind of login failure. So I could graph out afterwards, like how many login failures did I have? Or how many login failures did I have for that specific user? Or how many failed logins did I have for that specific IP address? All of that is adding a lot of context and will make your logs much richer. But that's the general logging approach that we have around that. And then you might have metrics. And I guess most of you are using metrics as well, right? Maybe, hopefully, um, probably something like this, um, Prometheus. Um, or in our stack, it looks something like this, but it generally the same idea. You have a lot of metrics where you aggregate stuff together. And then you maybe want to get to a bit more higher level services and like think about more what are your metrics actually doing. So you don't just have random numbers, but you think what you have. Like, is everybody familiar with SLI, SLA, and SLO? kind of sum the service level indicator, um, objective, and then agreement, what you have agreed on. So the indicator is basically um, where do you stand today? Agreement is what you guarantee to others, and objective is what you plan to do. And that's kind of like you have these numbers, and then you try like, what do I try to reach? What do I guarantee towards others? And then how am I doing overall? Or Google also has this thing, the, the four golden signals that they have, like latency, like how long are we people basically waiting for things to happen? How busy am I serving th stuff or how busy is my service? What is my error rate? And the saturation is like how high is the utilization of my stuff? And this is generally what you want to have. Like you don't just have numbers, but you want to tie your numbers a bit more to your application to see what is actually happening. And that's what you get out of metrics. So you have numbers, but they don't show you the full picture or the full context of that. Um, then you might do some uptime monitoring. Is anybody doing uptime monitoring? That's probably a much wider field in tools. I don't know. I've used this one as long as it was free for a long time. Probably others have used ping, ping them as well. Um, and we have something there as well that looks something like this, where you have like, these are the services you have. Like you see when were they responding or when were they not responding. And for example, how, how long did it take them to respond? Like you could drill into each one of those. That's uptime. And then um, what you want to have from uptime normally is you might want to have something like synthetic or proactive or active uptime monitoring. Is anybody you doing that? Or is anybody familiar with the term synthetic uptime monitoring? It's pretty much you have something that simulates a user. And the general idea is rather than wait for a user to run into a problem and then have an unhappy user, you have like a script that runs through the general processes on your site. And then the script figures out something is broken before a user is actually affected by that. That is something you might want to do as well. So for example, if you have a shopping cart, then you might have a script that is running through your shopping cart and checks that you can put something in your shopping cart and you can check out and you can pay so that you don't have any users who fail to actually buy something from your shop. So that's the general idea that you want to have that synthetic proactive monitoring there. And then you want, might have traces. Is anybody using tracing already? A couple and some half sure hands. OK. Um, maybe you're using one of these. Um, is anybody using Sipkin? Jaeger? OK, that's even fewer. OK, so most of you Sipkin. Um, yeah, those are two widely used tracing tools. Um, 
we also have our own, which might look something like this, but I'll show you a bit more about that. So generally what we have in tracing, and I don't want to make too much differentiation between this APM, the application performance monitoring and distributed tracing, because some people are very much like APM was the old thing that you used with your monolith and distributed tracing is a new thing and everything before was terrible. I don't want to make too much of that differentiation. It's more like I want to have a look into my application and I want to have like the context of the entire call around it. But I don't want to make like, okay, this is called like this and this is this other naming convention. I don't want to dive too much into that. So why am I talking about that? If you have not met me before, uh, I work for Elastic, the company behind these products. Like maybe you're using some of that for logging or for other stuff, but we have kind of evolved that. So it started off with search and logs and we do metrics. And then we expanded that, for example, to traces as well. So you can even put all of those services um, around it and then collect the traces as well. What did rum stand for? And it's not a drink. I think we, c yes, uh, real-time user monitoring. Um, so basically, it's something like you put, for example, in your front, front-end application, client-side application, and it sees what the user is basically seeing from the user experience. Or you look at the backend. But since I called this entire thing like for Java developers, we'll stick pretty much to the backend for today. So we won't go too much into client-side real-time user monitoring. Um, the Wikipedia definition of all of this, or application performance monitoring, I think, is the monitoring and management of performance and availability of software applications, which used to be simpler. Like, back in the old days when you had a monolith, this was simple. Um, this was easy to monitor. Nowadays, things are more complicated, like everything is connected to everything else and everything is calling everything else. Um, this is, by the way, great for vendors. Because now you suddenly have a lot of tooling that everybody needs to make your stuff work again and keep track of what's going on. So I'm all for microservices in that regard. Um, if you need them, that's a totally different discussion I don't want to start. But if you have something that is highly distributed and you want to see what's going on, well, there are a lot of tools out there to help you. Um, so generally, if you want to do tracing, or why am I even doing tracing? So the general idea is I have transactions and I want to see more context. And the idea of the context is logs are nice, but logs are kind of like at one, one point basically in your whole transaction. It doesn't show you the full picture. It also doesn't show you like this thing is calling this other thing and in combination they are slow. Like you might have some log event here and you might have some log event there, but you don't really have them correlated in the right way. What you also want to have is you want to reconstruct the flow in your application to see like what is even calling what. Sometimes when your microservice architecture grows really wild, you might not even know what the architecture is anymore. And then with distributed tracing, you can even figure out like what is calling what and how is my entire system connected. And you maybe want to query and visualize what transactions you have in your system and how they are being called. Um, how do I get to all of that information? The magic or most of the work is in the agents. So you have these agents to collect the information. And where the work in the agent is, is generally in the language or framework specific implementation. So the agent has basically to understand what is your code doing here or what is the framework code doing here to actually know what is the context. So for example, how, how would, um, if I have servlet and a user logs in, where is that user information stored? There's this thing called the J session ID which is pretty widely used in the servlet context. So what you would do, for example, with an agent that supports Java, you would know that the J session ID, this is where the user information is kept. And then you could extract that and keep track of like which uh, transactions were related to one specific user, for example. So this is just one example of how you tie into specific frameworks and languages. And this will be totally different for any other languages than Java because they don't have a J session ID. And what you generally want to do is you want to have the start and the end of a transaction, and you want to also capture if something goes wrong. And then you collect that and you show to people, okay, this is what failed here, and let's see what we can fix there. Um, you also want to wrap um, standard and generally known third-party libraries. So for example, if you have a library like Hibernate, it would probably make sense that your framework understands or your agent understands Hibernate, so you know what was the SQL query that was being run here, so you can extract that and see was it a bad SQL query or how long did the SQL query take. 
<clears throat> and that is mainly the work that you put into an agent. That's why it generally takes a lot of work to build an agent because you have a lot of integrations you need to cover. And then you add additional information. So for example, if you run the query against Redis, you try to extract what was the Redis query. All of that is additional metadata that your agent is trying to put into that entire context. Um, and the idea here is that an agent has little to no overhead. So that is what is making the difference to a profiler. Is anybody using profilers? Like, what are you using, your kit or your kit? OK. Um, does anybody know what is the difference between a profiler and APM or tracing? Yeah, shout. What? Okay, yeah. Um, the way I would always see it is that the, the profiler that you run is something you run more or less client side. Like you connect to your application ser or server and you run it on your machine, but it's kind of like client side run initiated. Whereas the tracing in APM is always a server side process. And also in terms of overhead, the profiler is oftentimes a bit heavier because you only, when you want to debug something, you add that on top. Whereas the tracing you run continuously, that's why you want to keep that minimal. And that's kind of where the difference is, that the profiler is kind of heavier in client side, and APM tracing is server side and tries to have as little overhead as possible. And that's why you only trace and hook into processes, but don't, you don't do the full profiling there. And how do you attach, depending a bit on the language? In Java, how do you connect your agents normally to your application? Probably through a Java agent. So that's the nice way in Java that you only have this runtime dependency. When you build it, you don't have that built in. You don't have ex any extra dependencies that you need to add. You just add Java agent, and then you can attach that to a running process. In many or most other programming languages, you don't have that luxury, by the way. There you need to have a built dependency that you bake into your application to actually capture data. Um, and what tracing generally looks like is you might have one or more services. And that is um, the entire transaction here. So all of this is one transaction. And then the transaction is split into so-called spans. And the spans is basically a unit of work. And you see here, you have a parent span. And that parent span could initiate another child span on the other side. And you can also see how logs basically relate to those spans. Like a log is at one specific point in time, you extract some information. But you're basically missing the bigger picture. Whereas tracing, or the idea of tracing is that once you start that thing, you follow the call throughout the entire system, and then call like the entire call stack, but also all network calls and all external dependencies that you have. And you have more context what is happening around the entire thing. That's the idea here. Open tracing as a standard is the promise that you have a vendor neutral API for tracing. However, it is being sunsetted or going away. Though still everybody is talking about open tracing, so it's kind of the thing that you want to have. And what open tracing, especially in a distributed context, gives you is just a header format. So it defines like you have a header, and you basically keep that header as the call goes throughout your system. And this is what one example could look like. You Here you define that you have a trace parent, and then you have the actual trace ID, you have the parent, and then you can add, for example, a flag or a version. And this is basically the information that all your calls keep. And as long as everybody keeps the convention of this is how the headers are called, your agents can basically follow something that is th one call or one transaction that is flowing throughout your system. Um, and that's also the general idea. The first time your call hits your service, you generate the unique ID, and that unique ID is then carried around. And basically, based on that unique ID and then all the spans that are within that, you can follow the calls and whatever is your application doing. So that's the overall idea. And then, after open tracing, we were about to get open telemetry, though it's still a bit work in progress. And the idea is that the best of open tracing and open census are being combined. And that gives you a bit more than headers, but that actually gives you um, a spec for the implementation as well. And the idea is to have that as backwards compatible as possible. Um, however, 
if that will fully work out is still a bit under discussion. And the nice thing about this is that the general idea is that you will have, this is a bit of a mouthful, a pluggable collector process exporter. So rather than right now, we have basically defined these are the headers and the headers are generic, but the exporter of what you actually get out as data is very specific to the implementation. So Jaeger and Sipkin and our tracing and many others, they all have different data formats that they basically emit. And the idea is that here you have one exporter process and you can have different exporter processes, but you can all tie into the same agents. So you might or not everybody might need to do their own agents anymore, which would make development a lot easier. But we'll see if that will happen. Um, another important concept of this entire tracing thing is sampling. The naive approach is every single call that you do, you collect that. But it might get very expensive because you have a lot of metadata around every single call and a lot of them are probably not that interesting. So oftentimes, or the simple approach is that you randomly just collect like 1% or 5% or whatever of your calls. And the assumption is that you randomly do that and that bad stuff will basically happen often enough that randomly you will also collect the bad stuff. The kind of more interesting approach is that you try to look for interesting things happening in your system. And the interesting part is, for example, that the random approach is when a, a request comes in, you could, when it first reaches your service, you could decide, I want to collect this or not. Whereas if you're looking for interesting stuff, you would have to make that decision at the end. When you basically say, okay, this is a call that took very long, or this is a call that had some errors in between. And that's the thing that I want to collect then. It's not just all the quick and successful calls that are interesting, but more like the stuff that is slow and that is failing. But that decision you can also make at the end of a service and not at the beginning. And depending on the agent that you're using, it might be possible to do that or not. For example, we have an APM agent and right now it's simple because it's only using the random approach. So for example, if you have a single service, um, then it's just randomly or when the request comes in, decide it. When it's distributed, then the first service basically chooses if that transaction should be collected or not. And we don't figure out later on, oh, well, this was slow, so I might have been interested. Or there was an error, and now I might have been interested. Like you decide upfront if you collect the trace or not, which is not that smart and we'll change that. Um, then another component that you often have is a so-called APM server. The APM server is generally a separate process that receives the traces from the agent, and then it can transform, maybe aggregate them and enrich them. Um, for example, for our specific ones, like ours is written in Go, there are different implementations for APM servers. Um, you could have stuff like authentication or um, rate limiting there as well, so you don't overload your backend. The other important thing is why do you even have an APM server? For example, we were mentioning RUM, the real-time user monitoring before, which comes from the client side. You probably don't want to expose your data store directly to any client side application, but you want to have this buffer in between. Um, the other thing with the buffer is if your storage backend, Elasticsearch, for example, is pretty common as a storage backend for traces. Um, if your storage backend, you do an upgrade or it goes down for a moment, you want to have this buffer to keep the traces in between. Or if we break an API, which unfortunately we sometimes do, if you have this intermediary layer of an APM server, that can then kind of like circumvent any API breaking changes and keep your agents working even if you change stuff. So there are a lot of good reasons why you want to have an APM server as well and not just an agent sending directly into a data store. Um, to instrument your code is basically you have two options. Either you do it automatic or you do it manual. The automatic way is of course the nicer one because it's like minimum or minimally invasive. Generally with Java you add the dash Java agent and that's all there is. There is no runtime dependencies. For most other programming languages um, you have a dependency and then you need to initialize it. So for example this is a list of what this would look in other programming languages. Like there you would need to have in some main class basically where your application starts up um, you would have one of these many ways to actually start the instrumentation. So you need to manually start that. You have a dependency and then you need to start that. For Java it looks differently. For Java you could do something like this for example. You have dash Java agent, then you just start your jar and that's pretty much it. 
and you don't need to write any custom code and you can just exchange the agent that monitors your application at runtime or just add it. So even if your development team doesn't care about tracing, your, pro your ops team could just add the Java agent just for production to figure out what is going wrong. Or you could just add it for development because you don't want to have the overhead in production, for example, or whatever. So this is totally up to you. You can then just throw in some configurations, like what is the configuration name, where do you want to send your traces. Um, why might I want to add that application packages where I basically annotate my own namespace? Why would I annotate that, for example? Any guesses? Yeah? Right. And the other thing is probably you're mostly interested in your own code and not in figuring out what is the framework that you're using doing. Because most of the time, it's in your code what the problem is. So you want to kind of like be able to figure out what, what is from your code and what is not. Um, yeah, that's kind of like for the instrumentation here. For the manual instrumentation, um, you would need to wrap code manually. Like you have a dependency and you need to wrap it. For example, for Go, um, we don't have any automatic transformation or a, a, a instrumentation. So this would be kind of like the original code. You have a server and you have a handler. And then you basically add a dependency and you wrap that call here in, a p in an explicit APM handler. So this is an explicit way to call the code. Like here, you don't just like start it once, but you annotate where the action is happening basically to collect the data out of that. So that's what you can do if there is no automatic instrumentation here. Um, or, for example, for Java, it might look something like this, um, where I add an agent. Like here, I add a general agent, or I add an open tracing API, which also doesn't work through um, the Java agent, ex at least in our examples. And then you could do something like this. Here, you have, for example, a span ID, where I basically explicitly say, here, I capture this span. I give it that name here, and then I say here, this is the span, I add a custom tag like foobar, which is not a great example, but here I'm adding a custom tag. So this is not hand being handled automatically because I want to have this structured information, I want to add that explicitly. So here you could, for example, say like, I don't know, this is the shopping cart ID, or this is some other meaningful information that you want to have in a trace and that you can filter down on that, for example, or that you just have extra meaning on top of that. So if the framework cannot gather that automatically or it's domain specific, you can annotate it explicitly and add metadata as you need to. That's the idea there. Or you could use open tracing where you have here we have a trace builder, and we have an o we give it the name Open Tracing Product Span. Um, I add some structured information here again as well, where I have a tag with product ID and then the actual product ID, and then I do whatever I do in my general call, and then I have a finally where I finish the span, and then this entire thing is basically rolled together and collected. Why would I even want to use an Open Tracing bridge if I have my own instrumentation? Any guesses? Maybe your implementation doesn't support all the tools that are out there. And maybe these tools support open tracing, and then you can basically take the open tracing headers and translate them to your custom system. So for example, for us, we didn't have had MongoDB support for a long time. But the MongoDB client for Java, for example, had an open uh, tracing bridge. So you could just hook into open tracing there reuse their headers, but then extract the right information for the format that whatever APM agent you're using, you need. So that's kind of the point there that if your agent doesn't support a specific system, but it does support open tracing, you basically hook into those IDs to extract the right information from those. So that's what you get out of those. And then you could do something like this. So just to give you a very quick example, since we have some time, um, I have my application here, um, you can see, I don't know, we could look at some products, we can see, um, since I'm from Vienna, the Vienna roast is maybe my favorite roast, I don't know. Um, you could get some 
customers and then you see this was maybe not a very good idea because this is a very li long list of customers and all of this should be collected. So as we've said, we just added the dash Java agent to get out whatever information we're currently doing here. And then here we can see one specific customer. So let's have a look. Here we have our Java application in the general overview. And let's say not the last 24 hours because my laptop has not been running that long. But this shouldn't be happening. Let's start this over. OK, this looks better. So my application was pretty li much quiet recently, but now I started doing more stuff. And first off here, you can, for example, see where am I spending my time? Is it in my own application? Is it in my database? Like I'm just using H2, the embedded database here, to keep it simple, but any other database like through JDBC would be supported here? Or is it some internal resources which are basically wasting the CPU cycles? Then you could see something like here, this is like how long was I waiting for my transaction to finish? Like you can see the 95th percentile was 500 milliseconds, so this is pretty decent. I don't have a 99th percentile because I haven't been doing enough requests yet. So that's why we, we didn't get to that point yet. And you can see how many requests, like by default, we were doing six requests a minute. Uh, and now since I was doing a few more, we were up to 30 requests against my service that was happening. And down here, you can actually see the class and then the method where stuff is happening. And this is by default, for example, here sorted by the impact. And the impact is basically how long did it take on average? How frequently is it being called? The higher the number, the higher the impact. So basically it gives you an overview of like what is slow and affecting most users or most calls, basically. You could, of course, reorder that and say, or just go for like which were the slowest calls, but this is actually the slowest call anyway. Um, this one here is happening more often, but this is very fast, so that's not that interesting. So for example, now we could look at the actual top products, and in the top products you see this is what I've just started to call here. Um, you could again see the chart, which for some reason here doesn't render anything, but let's forget that chart here. You can see here I was doing one request that was taking 450 to 500 milliseconds, and you can see the actual calls. So I was calling the method top products, and this was the underlying SQL query in the background. And you can just open that one, and then you can see this was the SQL query. And this is again the magic where the agent comes into play. So the agent needs to understand like what is the JDBC call, what is the Hibernate query, um, to extract that and store that. It also understands stuff like, okay, this is an H2 database, um, this is th where you spend 60 something percent of your time, and it knows this is my own application. So in API REST controller on line 98, this is where I was calling. And then we have some more library frames around it. So in my example, this is a very simple Spring Boot application. So the rest of the frames are all Spring Boot and whatever Spring Boot dependencies you have in there. So you can see what those are up to. You could also, for example, um, view the actual span. Then you can see the actual documents behind it. And you can see here, this took the right span ID since this was unique. This is the underlying data then what we have been collecting in that span. So you can see here, this is a transaction from my Java application. This was the actual SQL query. And this is all the raw data behind this one. Okay, let's head back to my tracing. This would also discover any services that I have running here. Um, now we are back here. You can see this is when I did my requests and it was spiking there. Um, we can also look at another one. I think we were looking at top products. Let's look at products, for example. Here you can see um, this is a custom annotation, whereas I have annotation product span. And here we have the foo bar that I've shown you as an example before. So that was just to tie that to the right code. This one here. Um, this is where we said annotation product span. This was the name, and this is the key value for uh, pair foo bar on which you could filter down then as well. And this is how you have custom labels, and otherwise this was not super exciting, but here we just inserted another custom span uh, before doing the actual SQL query. 
So you can just add custom spans as you need. Um, other things that might be interesting here. You could, for example, say like transaction results. I only want to see the 500s. If you have 500s, like I didn't cause any 500s yet, um, but we can trigger one. And that one has the name, is it, oops, time for coffee, I think. No, crap. Wh what was it called? Something like this. Uh, uh, give me one second, I need to cheat. Is it coffee time? Okay. Is it coffee time? This one. Okay, now we got an error. Um, and now we could actually, if I refresh that one, hopefully this one will show up. Then based on the transaction results, now we have a 500. Maybe we're more interested in the 500. We could just filter down just on this 500. And then you see, okay, there was this one call that was a 500. That was the index error controller. Not very surprising. And then you could see like, okay, this is where the 500 error was happening. We can open this one here and it actually shows me the error. So here we see this is demo exception and then we could see the entire span of what is in that one. And you can see the entire stack trace there. Um, this one is also pretty simple. Um, if I go to my index controller um, here, the is it coffee time? throws a runtime exception, and this is what we've basically been collecting here. So this is also pretty sim simple. Um, another thing that is kind of nice here is that it also extracts metrics automatically. Um, so uh, sorry, if you, if you remove those filters because they don't make any sense for the metrics, it will automatically extract what your system is up to. So you can see, for example, when your CPU was spiking, how your memory was doing. If your heap is doing okay, okay, here it looks like we had a small garbage collection, but this is fine. How your non-heap memory is doing and how the count of your threads are. And this gives you the general overview. This would also tie in, for example, if you have Kubernetes, you could filter down on a specific pod. I don't have Kubernetes here. I just have containers, but it's only one, so filtering down on that one container won't help you much. But you would, for example, tie into any container or Kubernetes stuff here as well. And the same applies to the transactions, for example. You could filter down to one specific pod um, to see what transactions that one was running. Okay, any other questions? What you could also do, for example, is you could say transaction duration is greater than, let's say, 300 milliseconds, uh, and since those are microseconds, um, how many zeros do I need? No. Yes, five would be good. Let's see if we have any calls that are slower than 300 milliseconds. Um, we see we only have those two. We can see how long they were taking, and then we could just look at those slow ones. And also this entire call down here, everything is filtered by this now. If you have, for example, a user, and the user complains afterwards that something was slow or something was broken, you could just filter down on that specific user and just see how the system was behaving for that user. That's kind of the nice combination since everything is based on a full text search engine, you can very easily filter down on things. And you can see here, okay, this is where we spent 475 milliseconds, and we spent almost 300 milliseconds with that SQL query alone. Like maybe we should look at that SQL query because that was not so fast, and you can also see where it was being called. So you would figure out where to go and trace that stuff. So. Those we have all seen. Um, one thing that is kind of nice is that all of that is just another index. It's pretty much like your logs. Um, so if you look at that, it would be split up into multiple indices. I don't think I want to, sh or you want to see all the raw data behind that, but you could just see what is behind all of those. You could just do something like this, and then you see the raw data behind that. Um, the other thing that is kind of more interesting maybe is how to clean up and how to scale this. So how long do you want to keep traces around in general? Any guesses? Yeah, 
What it, w w or what is the, the answer that the consultant would give you? Yes, it depends, exactly. Whenever a consultant says it depends, it will cost a lot of money afterwards. Um, Yes, that's actually a very good point because if you look at the raw data here, for example, probably or maybe you want to keep your errors longer than the general transaction suspense because those might give you more hints. So you could just add a custom lifecycle for that. But what we often see is that when you ask the business side, how long do you want to keep your data, they will say a year because that's the first thing they can think of. And they say, okay, it will cost you X. And then people say like, okay, seven days is also good. That's kind of the common thing you see. Um, but to actually define that, um, I've slightly modified. This is not the default lifecycle that we have here. But this will do two things that are important. First, it will make sure that it only creates a new index once you have reached one of these two conditions. So either after 50 gigabytes or after one day. And the other thing is here I define that after 30 days, I want to delete the data. And you could apply that policy to any one of these indices of how long you want to keep it. So you can just fine tune that and it will kind of like clean up automatically. And with this one here, you can keep that pretty scalable because it will just create the right number of indices, even though if you have a lot of data coming in or not so much data. So you won't have too many shards or too few shards or like things that might impact you performance wise. Um, another thing that people often ask is like overhead. How much overhead will this cost? Um, like, the agents are generally pretty careful with that. Um, so the reporting is generally done on a background thread, so it's not add, trying to add latency to the actual call that you have. You should try to avoid any data structures that have lock contention, so there are the right data structures to use those. And we try to avoid garbage collections with an object pool. So for example, what the life cycle of a trace looks like is you have an object pool, and then your application does something, and then you re record the one request, and then it goes into a queue. The queue will batch up multiple requests. You have the background thread that will send the data away, and then that um, object is being returned to the pool, so it will be reused. So this is not adding garbage collection. So it's just adding the same objects are moving through this life cycle, um, picking up data, sending out data, being empty again and going through the same cycle again. And that avoids a lot of garbage collection if you reuse um, your, sp your memory like that. Um, we've benchmarked that, for example, um, and we were able to have, with 99.99th percentile, single digit microsecond um, overhead in logging. Um, I think we are still needing to do the multi threaded benchmarks, though. Um, memory wise, it should be pretty small because it's just a static overhead or a static pool. Um, so that should be a couple of megabytes in general. So nothing that would kill your application. That is really important with APM agents that they don't try to have too much overhead there. Um, and here, for example, we ran a uh, request with HTTP and JDBC, and those were allocating less than one byte for each of those requests, um, just to not have un unnecessary garbage collections in your cycles here. Um, sometimes you see people say, like, our agent has zero overhead. What is your answer to that? <laughs> yes, I, I don't believe it. Um, like, probably if you, if you lie, you should probably say, like, my, my agent has negative overhead. Because if you lie, then do it properly. Um, because there is no such thing as zero overhead um, tracing collection, like, you somehow need to collect it and send it over. Like there is, there is no zero in that one. Um, okay. So since we have only five minutes left, logs, metrics, uptime traces are all kind of tools that you can use. Why did we want to have tracing again, or what was tracing giving us what the other systems were not doing? Context exactly. So a log, for example, is also giving you a lot of information and is pretty broad but it doesn't follow one trace across services. It's pretty much like, okay, this is one event here, 
and we lock this, but it doesn't give you the full context overall. So this is basically what you do with tracing and distributed tracing. Metrics are great to have a general overview, and they're great to aggregate or downsample later on, but they also don't show you the details of why something happens. The same thing for uptime monitoring, that's pretty much a black box. It's just seeing, like, does it work, does it not work? And then you will need to look, like, both in the logs and the traces of what is actually going wrong. Um, if you want to try this out um, with the code I've shown you, what you basically do is you do a git clone of this repository, and do, then you do a docker compose up, and then you download half the internet, but then it will run. Um, and it needs, I don't know, a good amount of memory, like something like five, six gigabytes of memory. Uh, but otherwise, you can run this entire demo like this. Like, it will bring up Elasticsearch and Kibana and the APM server and the Java application and add the APM agent as well. And it will just start that and collect. And you can then go to your OpBeans application and run that. And we have that same thing for most of the programming languages. So in case you're not a Java programmer, you can just add dash Python or whatever, and we'll do the same thing for Python. Um, so if you want to give it a shot, that's the place. Um, yes. So kind of like we always put the Elasticsearch in the middle, and then you can do lots of other stuff around it. Um, we call it the kind of center of the engine. Any questions? I think we have three minutes left for questions. Or any other stuff that you want to see in here? Yes, shout. Yes. Uh, if I have vanilla logs in my ELK, and now I want to add uh, tracing them yes. using this Java agent, for example, how can I uh, like correlate my trace traces with my old by an old vanilla logs? Yes, that's a very good point. Um, so you can add something here. Let me show you. Actually, it's in this one here. Here, in we have one setting here enable log correlation true, that will then add the right header to your logs, or basically it will use the same ID in your logs as in your traces, and you can link over to those. And since I didn't want to do too much logging here, but there's one thing in your dependencies, bless you, um, that, <laughs> that will make your life a lot easier. We have this library here, and this is basically for log back or log for j1 or log for j2, it's a structured log output that spits out JSON, and it will put or add all the right headers. So if you have in the APM agent that correlation ID enabled and you use a logging output format there, it will use the same ID, and then you can just link over to the other one. Okay, I think, but, uh, uh, thank you, but that seems to change the plain old log structure, right, by adding this dependency. So it changes the the log structure, the the, the plan all changes. You you mean because you have different fields basically in your log? Uh, yes, probably. Or I mean, what it does is it mostly adds another field, um, but this this entire thing is logging to JSON. So this is generally what we kind of like to have, like a structured format, and not have to parse the okay, classic I log line. I got you. And then, if it's structured, it doesn't really make so much difference if you add an attribute or not. Agree. OK, thank you. Does it make sense? OK. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Hello, thank you for the presentation. I have a question about GDK support. Uh, does uh, this agent support uh, GDK 11 or upper? Yes. So it's, it already supports GDK 11, right? Yes, it does support. Um, I think we support from 6 onwards, but also newer ones, like definitely the new ones as well, but 6 included. Yeah, uh, we are already on 8, and we are going to migrate to 11. Yes, that's not a problem. We also um, support weird shit like IBM JDK and stuff like that. So. More modern JDKs are uh, not a problem. Uh, just to give you an idea, where do you look that up? Um, Elastic APM Java supported technologies. And this is basically what is making up the gist, like I said. This is kind of like the core feature set 
that an agent brings, the supporting technologies. So you can see these are the JDKs that we support, like IBM G9, which yeah, it's interesting. And then we tie into a lot of these APIs. So if you use Spring Boot or Servlet or whatever, or any of these application servers, um, those will be supported. And these are, for example, the database technologies or the network async frameworks, et cetera. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Hello. Uh, right. One question about uh, security. Security, okay. Yes, uh, we add your uh, agent and all our uh, SQL or logs uh, enriched with passwords, with tokens, go to Elastic. How maybe uh, some support for obfuscation or? Yes. So here you can see this one here is redacted. Is that large enough to read? Like it's a the J session ID, for example. Um, so this one would. So if we know the field and we know it's a sensitive field, it would automatically be removed. If you log something explicitly that is sensitive, we can't really help it. Like if you put it into a log statement, th that's up to you. But if it's kind of like something that we know and understand, like a J session ID, we would scrub the J session ID from the headers, for example. We're collecting all the headers, but the sensitive ones we would sanitize automatically so that we don't collect any sensitive fields there. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay, I think we're pretty much out of time. Any final questions? No? Okay, thanks a lot. If you want stickers, grab stickers. Um, there are all kinds of different ones. Um, thanks a lot. <laughs>